symptomatic of the fraudulence of the entire 3D fad through which we are currently suffering. Not only does it highlight the technical shortcomings of the process, but more importantly, it demonstrates that the current 3D craze has nothing to do with what's on screen and everything to do with what's in your wallet. Terrified by piracy and goggle-eyed by the spectre of Avatar, Hollywood studios told audiences that 3D was the future and then made sure that it was by any means necessary. And it worked, at least for a while. Clash of the Titans took around $450 million worldwide, not quite what the suits were hoping for perhaps, and certainly not a patch on Avatar's box office bonanza, but still far better than the spectacular floppage this mishandled stereoscopic mess of a movie clearly deserved to suffer. Duly emboldened, the executives declared that all future blockbusters would be released in 3D, whether their creators and or audiences liked it or not. Suddenly, 3D was not an option, it was an order, an edict, an inevitability. Not everyone fell in line, thank God. Christopher Nolan was an outspoken critic of the dimness and colour desaturation caused by wearing 3D glasses, complaining in particularly erudite terms about the loss of foot lamberts, a measurement of light used in relation to the projected image. On a technical level, it's fascinating, he explained, but on an experiential level, I find the dimness of the image extremely alienating. Nolan's longtime cinematographer Wally Pfister, more of whom in Chapter 5, was rather more blunt, calling 3D a fad. Go Wally. Despite huge industry pressure, Nolan insisted on shooting Inception in 2D rather than throwing his hat in with the stereoscopic mob, thereby scoring, as we have seen, one of the biggest hits of the year. In the autumn of 2010, Nolan confirmed that his third Batman movie, The Dark Knight Rises, would also be a 2D production, with key sequences shot in the IMAX format, the modern equivalent of Cinerama, which, he argued, offered the most immersive experience available. Yet even Nolan sounded a note of caution, pointing out that he couldn't fight the market pressures if audiences demanded 3D in future. There's no question that if audiences want to watch films in stereoscopic imaging, he confessed, then that's what the studios will be doing, and that's what I'll be doing. The unanswered question behind this carefully worded statement is whether or not audiences really do want to watch films in stereoscopic imaging, or whether they are merely doing what they've been told to do by studios attempting to squeeze the maximum amount of profit out of the minimum amount of artistic effort. John Borman once said that movie making was essentially a process of turning money into light and then back into money again. But in the age of 3D, it seems to have become a process of turning money into less light and then back into more money, whether the audience like it or not. The nadir of the dimness issue came in May 2011, when it was revealed that a multiplex chain in the Boston area of America had been projecting 2D movies through 3D lenses, causing light loss of up to a staggering 85%. According to a report in the Boston Globe, the Sony digital projectors used by AMC and others require the attachment of a special lens which alternates rapidly between two polarised images in order to project movies in 3D. Unfortunately, this lens was being left on the projectors even when 2D films were being shown, resulting in a dramatic darkening of the image. A walk through the AMC Lowe's Boston Common on Tremont Street one evening in mid-April illustrates the problem, wrote journalist Ty Burr. Gloomy, underlit images on eight of the multiplex's 19 screens, theatres 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 15 and 18 to be specific. These are the auditoriums using new digital projectors that are transforming the movie exhibition business, machines that entirely do away with celluloid. A visit to the Regal Fenway two weeks later turned up similar issues. Water for Elephants and Medea's Big Happy Family were playing in brightly lit 35mm prints and, across the hall, in drastically darker digital versions. Such 2D darkening was drastic enough for director Peter Farrelly, helmsman of Hall Pass, to complain loudly about the lousy presentation of promo screenings for his film. Farrelly went from one screening where the 3D lens had been removed, reported the Globe, to a second in which the lens was still on and he couldn't believe his eyes. I walked into the room and I could barely see and my stomach dropped, the filmmaker said. The first screening looked spectacular and the second was so dark it was daytime versus nighttime. If they're doing this for a big screening, I can't imagine what they do for regular customers. That's no way to see a movie. According to the paper, the reason 3D lenses were being left on for the screening of 2D films 
was that removing them required the attention of someone qualified to do so, i.e. a trained projectionist, of whom, as we have previously noted, there are so few left nowadays. Moreover, thanks to the insane levels of anti-piracy software now built into digital projectors, cinemas have become scared of messing with the machinery at all, for fear that it will simply shut down and lock them out, thereby effectively closing one of their screens. Faced with the choice between allowing an unqualified staff member to fiddle around with a projector they didn't really understand, or simply letting the audience suffer up to 85% light loss, cinema managers apparently opted for the latter. And, as ever, the customer pays the price. So, is 3D here to stay this time? Ask anyone within the industry and they'll tell you that too much money has been spent to turn back now. Experiments are currently afoot to develop projection systems that will allow 3D movies to be viewed without glasses, the holy grail, while home viewing systems employing various forms of auto-stereoscopy are already on the market. Yet so far the outlook remains distinctly dodgy, despite the vast amount of money that's been spent. Take up on 3D televisions has been at best sluggish, and game makers Nintendo have already had to issue health warnings about their new 3DS handheld consoles, stating that the auto-stereo or glasses-free effect may damage the eye development of the young and produce nausea and headaches amongst adults. Some sales pitch, huh? Meanwhile, despite the best efforts of Hollywood, cinema goers have been steadily losing interest in 3D in exactly the same way that they did in the 20s, the 50s and the 80s. While James Cameron may have told Entertainment Weekly in 2010 that 3D movies are still performing well above their 2D versions, more viewers chose to watch Despicable Me in 2D than 3D that year, despite the fact that kid-friendly digital animation is considered to be the one genre for which audience enthusiasm is most fervent. When even the kids don't care about 3D, the end is most definitely in sight. The trend continued in the summer of 2011 with Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, the first stereoscopic instalment in the series for which 2D screenings accounted for around 60% of audience figures in the all-important opening weekend, a whopping slap in the face for 3D. A few weeks later, only 45% of Kung Fu Panda 2's opening weekend business was for 3D screenings, with 2D once again winning the popular vote. Nor did the so-called stereoscopic revolution stop audience attendance figures plunging to their lowest level in 15 years in 2010, marking a major drop from 2009 and strongly suggesting that 3D might not be the answer after all. In an article unambiguously headlined, Attendance crumbles in 2010. Box Office Mojo scribe Brandon Gray pointed out that although the industry shoved 3D down people's throats in the wake of Avatar's success, the apparently impressive sales figures these films racked up in 2010 boiled down to more money from fewer people. The 3D premiums alone, the difference between 3D and regular ticket prices, accounted for an estimated $600 million of the total box office. Or, to put it another way, fewer people ended up paying more money for less entertainment. Whichever way you spin it, that's not a success story in the making. The real bombshell, of course, came in early 2011, when, as noted in Chapter 2, the 3D motion capture digimation Mars Needs Moms took an intergalactic bath of the highest order. Costing somewhere between $150 and $175 million, depending as ever on your sources, and taking a measly $35 million worldwide, this otherwise unremarkable fantasy made headlines by flopping in the way that really big movies just don't do anymore. Attempting to explain this astonishing anomaly, the New York Times concluded that Mars Needs Moms had become the focus of a consumer referendum for 3D ticket pricing for children, the public voting with their feet by staying away in droves. Writing in The Independent, Jeffrey McNabb claimed that a simmering backlash against overpriced 3D had finally reached boiling point and quoted Belgian film producer-director Ben Stassen's suggestion that people might reject 3D as a whole and say the hell with that. The article was headlined, The $175 million flop so bad it could end the 3D boom. Meanwhile, back in Hollywood, the plugs were being pulled on producer Robert Zemeckis' long-planned 3D remake of Yellow Submarine, and Disney shut the doors on his Image Movers digital studio. It was a proper old-fashioned disaster, cinema's first fully-fledged 21st century train wreck in 3D.
Whether or not this all adds up to audiences throwing off the stereoscopic shackles is still a subject for debate. Like the banks that we all paid to bail out after they destroyed our economy, 3D may simply be considered too big to fail. And no matter how lousy the movies are or how much we may hate them, they're certainly not going to disappear overnight. The studios and multiplexes have too much invested in the format to let it die without a fight. As I write, Jeffrey Katzenberg is complaining that Hollywood has simply let viewers down with a slew of inferior 3D fare, but he remains confident that films like Michael Bay's Transformers Dark of the Moon and Spielberg's The Adventures of Tintin, The Secret of the Unicorn will reinvigorate waning audience enthusiasm. And of course, we all have Titanic 3D to look forward to in 2012. But will 3D be dead in the water by then? Again. In 2010, after spending millions of dollars attempting to convert Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 into 3D, Warner Brothers finally got wind of public dissatisfaction with the process and decided to release it in 2D instead, with record-breaking results. At the time of writing, advanced ticket sales for the 2D version of Deathly Hallows Part 2 are outstripping their 3D counterparts. You don't have to be a wizard to figure that the writing is on the wall. Meanwhile, a string of respectable directors such as Wim Wenders, Werner Herzog and, of course, Martin Scorsese have all dabbled in 3D, and although Wenders has declared himself wedded to the format, others are less evangelical. We have yet to see how Scorsese's Hugo Cabret fares with critics and audiences, but the slate of projects he has lined up to follow it is notably lacking in 3D outings. As for Herzog, he's declared that having made Cave of Forgotten Dreams in 3D, he has no intention to use the format again and remains every bit as sceptical about its unsuitability for narrative cinema as he was before. When I told him that I saw Cave in both 2D and 3D and much preferred the former, initially he replied that I was intellectually warped, which I took as a compliment. Later, he conceded that stereoscopy was inherently non-cinematic and promised not to do it again. If 3D has a creative future, it seems more likely to be in the arena of home entertainment than in expensively refitted cinemas. And it's probably not sports coverage, but computer gaming, with its key facet of interactivity, which is most perfectly poised to explore the virtual reality capabilities of 3D. As for 3D movies, other than Flesh for Frankenstein, I've only seen two stereoscopic productions that didn't leave me feeling underwhelmed. One was a spin-off of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the other was Terminator 2 3D, Cameron's dry run for Avatar. Crucially, both were short films, projected onto screens vast enough to almost overcome 3D's bizarre propensity for miniaturization. More importantly, neither were films in the classic sense. They were, in fact, part of theme park rides. Short thrill trips displayed in amusement parks, accompanied by vibrating seats, steam showers, laser shows, blasts of hot and cold air, and live actors running around the auditorium. They were fun, a reminder that cinema started life as a carnival sideshow, but that's all they were. Today, studio executives are attempting to drag us all back to the fairground, to take the Pirates of the Caribbean formula to its logical conclusion, and simply replace art with the roll-on, roll-off mechanics of the critic-proof theme park ride. There's nothing new about this. In fact, it's the oldest trick in the book. But then 3D has never been the future of cinema. It is, was, and always will be the past. <laughs>